February again on the Blockbuster Show, and you know what that means. A bunch of really crappy-ass, low-budget rom-coms. And this time, we are going to the lowest of low-budget. We're talking about the first film ever done by James Nguyen, the director of the Birdemic movies. Unfortunately, no, this movie doesn't have any exploding birds in it, but it definitely has a lot of the same kind of incompetence in terms of the production. Successful computer chip salesman Jack Livingston is looking for love. With a suggestion from his best friend Mark Stevens, he reluctantly subscribes to an internet dating service where he meets Julie Romanov, a computer software developer. That's it. That's, that's the description. 1.7 out of 10 on IMDb, and 15% on Rotten Tomatoes. God, I remember when I watched the first Birdemic. At the time, I thought it was like the worst movie I'd ever seen. <sighs> if only I had known what kind of movies I'd be forced to watch in the coming future. So if you've been following the Blockbuster show, you might remember that one of the earliest videos we did back when we were doing uh, sketch videos was a parody of Birdemic called Bugdemic Shockingly Terrible, and then we reviewed uh, the second film. Me and my friend Mike talked about that in its own full review, and earlier this year, in January, I talked about Birdemic 3 in the uh, Where Are These Movies Now special. So now we're finally going back to James Nguyen, but it's something not Birdemic. It's his very first feature film, Julie and Jack, which is essentially like the first 40 minutes of Birdemic, the crappy love story, but this time there's like a whole ghost science fiction twist to it. When I say the movie is a lot like the first 40 minutes of Birdemic, I, I mean that legitimately because it's basically a lot of the same story and a lot of the same actors come back too. Not the same people who play the main characters. That would be really funny if they somehow got even younger versions of Alan Baugh and Whitney Moore to show up, but yeah, no, that's, it's not them. In terms of the differences, Jack is a uh, computer chip salesman, unlike Rod in Birdemic, who was a software salesman, until eventually he went into sales <laughs> involving uh, Sorpaus. Well, he's not very good at his job. I wouldn't waste my time with Tony if I was you. That guy was my customer for two years and he never bought nothing. There's some other guy in his office who's like the top salesman and every single meeting they have to keep reminding us that this guy is the top salesman at the company. And I'd like to see more of you reaching the kind of sales Bill is pulling down. <laughs> keep up the great work. And this is one of the many scenes that just reminded me of Birdemic. Every time they showed people at this boardroom meeting location, it just kept reminding me of the scene in Birdemic where everyone's clapping. There's also a couple of scenes where Jack goes to visit his mom who is another reoccurring actress in James Nguyen's productions. She's the producer, and she's the one that played Natalie's mom in Birdemic. Hmm. You know, and, and I've noticed that you've been so happy lately. And I bet it's because of her. Well, you know how women are, honey. They, they like to play hard to get sometimes. I bet that's what's going on. Another similarity to Birdemic is the guy has a best friend. Uh, this time his name is Mark, but in Birdemic his name was Rick. At least that's what it said on IMDb. Uh, but they're the token best friend who are like sexaholics. They're constantly, you know, banging different chicks. Every time we see this guy at his apartment, he has like some different girl. What? What? Okay, can I get what? that? Get okay, what? The door. There's no door. There are no doors in this entire house. No, stay with me. Say no. no. There's no one yeah, there is. And this <laughs> results in one of the lines I laughed at in this movie. Uh, he's talking about how his sales aren't doing too hot, and the guy's like, oh, we'll just get a girlfriend. Yeah, my boss is hammering me about making my sales quota. So why are you not making your sales quota? I don't know. I think you need some inspiration. 
You know, you just broke up with Sarah. You know what I think? I think that you need a new girlfriend. Yes, because that's how you make your sales go up. If you get a girlfriend, automatically, your job performance just increases. Either way, he takes the guy's advice and joins an online dating service, and he comes face to face with the titular Julie, who's the blonde woman of the movie, and again, just like Birdemic, there are several points where they go to restaurants that James Nguyen either frequented or had permission to film at. To a très bad. You speak French. I'm impressed. Don't be. That's the only line I know. In one of the many scenes that has horrible framing, they're just sitting at a table in front of like a, a beige yellow wall and just eating. It's clearly not a restaurant, but the, the movie really wanted you to believe that it was a restaurant. And there's tons of stuff like this all throughout this film. These roses are so beautiful. Not just the terrible framing, but plenty of times where it's like, oh, we're at a specific location. Let's get a piece of paper and then use magic marker to write where it's supposed to be and then tape it to the wall. I would say it's at least better than After Last Season, but let's face it, that's a backhanded compliment. Everything in After Last Season was done terribly. This takes up a majority of the first half of the movie, of them going on dates. Uh, there's a point where they go to that same beach that was in the first Birdemic. They have like the same like rock quarry behind them and everything that they're walking along. Look at that cliff over there. Do you see those rock layers? They're at least 100 years old. There's probably about 10 layers. That's at least a thousand years old. Another thing that's similar to Birdemic, every time they're outside and the wind is blowing, it just fucks up the audio horribly. You want to know one of the things this movie does worse than Birdemic? Every single scene has something wrong with color grading and lighting. Like, there are several times where the, the saturation is so fucked up, it looks like everyone is standing in the middle of a nuclear winter. It's amazing what you start to miss. How first you miss the big things in life, like talking to people. Going back to how horrible the framing is, it feels like they didn't have more than one camera to work with. More than likely that's what it was. They probably used some 12-year-old camcorder. Who's the woman in the painting? Ada Lovelace. Lady Lovelace. A mathematician from the 19th century. There are many scenes that have horrible framing, but I'm just going to try and show the few that I can remember. Uh, the one that comes to mind is there's a scene where Jack is talking with his best friend and I don't know if it's because they couldn't zoom the camera out any further or move it back any further, but you know, you have two people who are practically sitting next to each other and they both look like they, if they lean any further, they're going to be just straight up out of frame. There are several times where they're standing outside and the camera is zoomed way too close because for all I know, they probably were filming without permits and they didn't want to get caught or they just wanted to do it in a super quick amount of time before authorities noticed that they were filming there without permission. There's one scene close to the end of the movie, but there's a scene where Julie and Jack are having a, a big emotional speech in this like rose garden area and the camera is so close up on the actress's face so many times. There's one scene where it's like, just zoom it out. But then it's like, oh, well, they kept it in that position so the guy could eventually walk into the frame and they'd both be on screen. Smelling a flower or feeling the breeze in your hair. Things you never gave much thought to when you're alive. At first I was like, oh, okay, that was weird, but understandable now that, now that you know what they were going for. But then they have an edit where it's a shot reverse shot where it's like show his face and then show her face and you know edit them talking back and forth. And again, her face is like cropped so horribly. It's like this, it's, this is what it's like. It's, it's positioned like this. It's like, why is your face so out of frame? It's so awkwardly framed. It's not that I don't love you, Jack. I would have done anything to have met you out there in the real world. But that's not how things turned out, is it? There are so many scenes that are like this in the movie. But I think my favorite example is near the end, uh, there's the big emotional speech where, you know, the two lovers have to confess and, you know, should they stay together or should they not? And I'm not shitting you, it's Jack is supposed to be standing with his arms crossed. And then, first of all, to show a passage of time, 
they have a crossfade to the exact same shot, and he's like this. It's, it's like this. For some reason, there's just so much empty space behind them, it's like, why are they doing that? And after a couple minutes, Julie shows up in the background, and she's microscopic. She's that far away. And it's like, everything about this is just so horribly incompetent. I gotta say, it's been a while since we've seen movies that are, like, this incompetent in terms of the framing, man. Like, not since, I don't know, Love on a Leash? and Time Machine I found at a yard sale. Like, I have not seen a movie that was this inept at almost everything. But going back to the plot, uh, the first half of the movie just has them go on dates, they go to restaurants, they walk on the beach, and the wind rapes the audio, of course, just like in Um There's a scene where they, they, they're wearing these like extravagant outfits, and I was like, what is this? And this is where they reveal a very crucial plot point they're supposed to be going on some 1920s or 1930s themed date and they reveal that they're able to change outfits and go to all these different places because this whole thing is actually a virtual reality system. I know none of this is real. That's all just virtual reality. <laughs> I know these columns aren't real. These birds are fake. My favorite thing is every time they show the computer screen, like the, the window that this is supposed to be in, first of all, they're using Firefox, so that's already a, that's already a step backwards. But it's also funny because it, it looks like an FMV game. The way they laid it out, it, it's like, fuck, I might as well be watching the cutscenes for Night Trap now. I was thinking, wait, virtual reality, that's how they're doing these dates. What, is this supposed to be a technologically advanced sci-fi film or something? Then I went back a couple scenes and they explained that Julie was really into science and she was trying to find some kind of technological breakthrough. So that was sort of subtle foreshadowing. Even though the rest of the movie it honestly just feels contemporary, it feels like just you know, modern day 2003. Every time Jack goes on a date with Julie, he tries to ask her specific questions like, you know, oh, what are your hobbies? What got you into a specific field? What was your job? She just tries to ignore it. Which school was it? Um, Grant University? Could you please pass me some more sweet and sour pork? You don't like talking about your past, do you? You've never even told me where you grew up. Is it really that important to you? I've known you for three months now. Where a person's from is usually first date information. I've always needed someone like you. Does that mean you're ready to tell me about yourself? No. So this is supposed to be them foreshadowing something. So he wants to go on a date with her in real life, but he doesn't know where she is. So then he manages to get a hold of a bunch of people that she knew, and he then goes to them and asks them questions about Julie, and then they talk about their connection to Julie, their relation to her, and we have a bunch of flashbacks where they talk about this stuff. And, uh, well, the first person that he goes to is played by James Nguyen. Professor Tran? Yeah. Hi, my name's Jack. Can I yeah. speak with you for a moment? Uh, I gotta go a cup of coffee. Probably not as gratuitous as, say, M. Night Shyamalan writing himself to be the Messiah and Lady in the Water. But it's close. It, it's like the fact that it's the first person and, oh, he just happened to work with Julie. Uh, they work at some advanced technological laboratory and they're trying to work on, you know, big computer things. When that happens, in theory, one can build a supercomputer or a neurocomputer the size of a baseball. Oh, and James Nguyen even name drops a specific movie. He says, instead of saying, yeah, it's like that movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, he gets the name wrong. <laughs> Neurocomputers a very smart and intelligent computers. It's like that HAL 9000 computer in that movie, uh, Space uh, Odyssey 2001. It's funny, James Nguyen has a cameo in his own movie, 
And even he seems bored with his own material. <laughs> I love how they end the scene too. It's almost as bad as Verdemic when they have the, oh, I hear a mountain lion, I gotta go. It was nice meeting you. It's almost on that level. It, they end the scene with him looking at his watch and it's just so stilted like, anyway, oh, look at the time. I gotta go. Yeah. Uh, well, Jack, you know, I, got, I, got, I gotta go now because I have lecture in 10 minutes. I say stuff like that was keeping me entertained and I wish there was more of it because Birdemic at least has the terrible gift birds, and when it becomes a schlocky horror movie where it's people trying to survive a bird apocalypse, that was what made Birdemic so entertaining. The bad dialogue, the stilted acting, stuff before that, yeah, that was bad, but it, it became even more entertainingly bad as it went along. Julian Jack only has a few scenes where you have really like bad dialogue and stilted performances that carry it all the way through. And even when this movie tries to have some kind of weird elements to it, like the virtual reality and stuff like that, it's still nowhere near as entertaining as seeing gift birds exploding. What's really funny is that this movie has more birds than Birdemic. There's a whole scene where they're standing out by a fountain and there's a bunch of birds floating around and I'm like, Damn it, if this was footage that he'd saved for Birdemic, he could have easily gone back and added like little stock explosion effects and, and made this the bird attack. There He's a great guy, despite his warped outlook on women and the whole mating ritual. It would have been really perfect for Birdemic, honestly. But man, yeah, this was 2003. There was some other movie that came out after this that was before Birdemic. It was called uh, Replica. I still haven't found a copy of that. I tried, but I couldn't find it. Um, and then Birdemic came out 2008 or 2010. I'm willing to believe that it was probably made in 2008, but it got popular online in 2010, 2011, something like that. But uh, yeah, so it was going to be a while for Birdemic. But still, that bird footage would have been perfect for that film. There's a bunch of other people he goes to. Uh, awkwardly enough, one is uh, Julie's ex. You're here to talk to me about Julie Romanoff, I believe? Yeah, I spoke with Susan. She mentioned that you and Julie dated for a while. Yeah, why he would want to ask her ex-boyfriend about how their relationship ended, that's really fucking weird. I guess I'm just not ready for that type of commitment right now. Well, I am. Um, he goes to one of her old college friends, and I love it because, again, you put up a banner that just says like party or whatever, or like put signs for colleges on the walls. Oh, we're in a college dorm party now. Hey Richard. Hey ladies, how's it going? Good. What's really funny about that scene is it segues from, he goes to one of Julie's old college friends and uh, she opens the door. It's like, oh yeah, I was Julie's best friend from college. How's she doing? I'm a friend of Julie Romanoff. Oh, Julie. You know her? Yeah, I know Julie. She's a good friend of mine. Yeah, how is she doing? So I guess they weren't really that good of friends if she didn't keep up with her. Not only do we get Natalie's mom, but we also get Damien Carter, the guy who sang Hanging Out With The Family. <laughs> Song in this movie, not as good as that, but it's still better than the song that was in Birdemic 2. That one was nowhere near as good. Nothing is ever going to top hanging out with the family. After going to all these people, it finally comes to a head when he visits Julie's parents, and her mom is played by Tippi Hedren, who was in The Birds. You know, we have to feed these little birds so often, otherwise they'd be very noisy. What's really amazing is there's a scene where she's going to check on some bird cage for like a pet bird they have. And that scene was featured in Birdemic. It was before the weird not sex scene between Rod and Natalie. It was on the TV in the background. Ultimately, it's revealed that Julie is dead. And Julie downloaded her spirit or her ghost or her conscience or something to the internet and the reason that she's been so secretive is because she didn't want to reveal that she was a ghost to Jack. Now the real question here is, if she wasn't trying to get discovered, why did she immediately go to a dating website? If she didn't want to reveal such crucial things and she just wanted to rest in peace in cyberspace or the Matrix or whatever, why would she try to hook up with people on a dating site? And that kind of question is just never addressed.
This is what ultimately leads to the horribly framed sequences of them talking while at these like rose gardens or whatever. And ultimately, uh, Jack has to figure out what he wants with his life, I guess, because ultimately the movie ends with him becoming the top salesman, even beating out uh, that smug asshat who was doing better than him. An employee who will not only go home with this simple symbol of achievement, but who will also go home with a fat bonus check. Jack Livingstone! Jack. Either way, yeah, Jack's now the top salesman, and the movie ends with him getting on one more VR chat group call cyberspace virtual reality date thing with Julie, and they have to figure out what they're going to do, and uh, Julie says that, well, sh she just can't because she's clearly in no place to have a relationship, being a ghost and all. I guess it's better that they had it this way instead of trying to force an ending where it's like, oh, he got into a car accident and now his soul is forever trapped in cyberspace with her. So now they can be together. I, I don't know. I guess it's more realistic they went with that. More realistic in 16 quotation marks. I remember reading a couple of like user reviews on IMDb that said that it was technically better than Birdemic. And it's like, I don't know about that. I mean, it's more consistent than Birdemic. The movie is just a straightforward, you know, romance story all the way through. Uh, and then halfway through, it then introduces this whole, like, sci-fi ghost story thing attached to it. But, uh, I don't know, Birdemic is more entertaining to me because of how bizarre it is. This one, it has bizarre things in it, but it's not as funny bad as Birdemic. Uh, it's kind of the opposite problem of Birdemic 2 in that Birdemic 2 is now trying to be self-aware and poke fun at the first Birdemic, but it doesn't do it right. Um, I will say, in comparison, Julian Jack is better than Birdemic 3, which feels like 20 steps backwards, even compared to the first Birdemic. But this movie, on the other hand, it's just a straightforward, boring love story with incredibly bad production. I mean, seriously, this looks like the kind of thing that belongs on, like, cable access. Uh, and the only reason that I think people know about it is because it's from the guy that made Birdemic. Um, I mean, it does make some of the choices in Birdemic make a little bit more sense if you look at this film as essentially a prototype for Birdemic. But yeah, it's still not as funny bad as Birdemic because Birdemic is basically Julian Jack if it was mixed with the birds. And it was one of the best worst movies up there with The Room and Troll 2. It's not even as funny bad compared to something like Love on a Leash because Love on a Leash was sort of the same thing as Birdemic in that... It was, like, mind-blowing the first time you see it. You're like, is this a real movie? I cannot fucking believe this is real. I guess after the initial sting of Birdemic, watching something like this, it's just like, oh, it's just basically the same movie with even less of a budget and even shittier production choices. I guess if I were to rate it, it's better than Birdemic 3, and it is a little bit more well-intentioned than Birdemic 2, which just felt like, uh, oh, we're trying to make a stab at the first Birdemic, but we still don't have enough self-awareness to make it good. Um, it's not as funny as Birdemic. God, I have seen so many bad movies throughout the years. <laughs> I really feel like we're getting more creative with these ratings. Well, I guess it's a little bit better than this piece of shit, but compared to this one, not as funny bad, or this one's not as good. Well, either way, I guess we're gonna have to see how it compares to the low-budget rom-com we're looking at next time from the good people at Maverick Films the same studio behind Battle Space, which we reviewed last year, we're going to be talking about Reverend I'm Available, a pseudo-Christian rom-com about a pastor who is now getting hit on by a bunch of horny middle-aged women at his church. Guess we'll have to see how that fares up against Battle Space, but until then, I'm Am Sykes of The Blockbuster Show, and we will see you guys in the next video.